Let me start by reiterating this is not the video that I took last week off to record. That video will be releasing at a later unspecified date as I'm going to be working on it between regular uploads mainly because it's around 90 hours of footage to go through as opposed to the usual 8 to 10 that most of these runs take. With that out of the way, back to the video at hand as I ask the question, can you beat Fallout 4 as a Silver Shroud? If for some reason you're watching a Fallout 4 video and have never played the game before and therefore have no idea who the Silver Shroud is, Basically, he is a fictional comic book character in the Fallout universe. The requirements for the run will be to only use his outfit and weapon for the entire challenge, and when given the opportunity, I shall speak like the Shroud. I also decided that other than just finishing the main quest, I would also need to take out the Mechanist at the end of the Automatron DLC. Because not only is there a unique dialogue interaction if you're in costume, but because I know one of the Silver Shroud radio dramas ends with the Silver Shroud inadvertently killing the Mechanist, so it seems rather fitting. Now, with all that out of the way, Let's begin. When it came to the character creation, I had a few ideas of what I could do, but then I figured that since the Silver Shroud is technically a mantle that anyone could become, that I would instead just go with a completely default character. In other words, four in every single special stat, and then the starting face for Nate. The only thing that I actually changed was my name to Silver Shroud. Of course, I cannot truly begin the video until I get the Silver Submachine Gun and costume, so Hubris Comics was my destination for the time being. I did make sure to stop off in my house in Sanctuary though, and read the I'm Special book. I put the point into Perception as I want to increase it to 7 as soon as possible to get the Refractor perk. Simply because, even when upgraded, the Silver Shroud costume isn't all that great against energy weapons, so I figured I might as well stock up in defence where I can. I got my first level almost immediately by acting like an overly aggressive tourist as I pushed past all the raiders waiting to get inside the Museum of Freedom so that once I stepped through the doors, it would complete the out of time quest and progress me to level 2. As mentioned, I just used the perk point for another level of perception. I meet up with Carla just down the road and trade her everything but the clothes on my back for a handful of 45 rounds. Little did I know at this point that collecting ammo was going to be the biggest pain of the run. But I digress, we can discuss that later. From here I had a rather uneventful trip to Hubris Comics, only really stopping to mark Diamond City on the map for future reference. Making my way past the ghouls inside the building was rather straightforward, mainly due to a Grodnak run that I started filming a while back where I had to do the exact same thing. That idea was ultimately scrapped in favour of this one, simply because it felt too similar in nature to my Fallout 4 as a Dragonborn video. Grabbing the gun and outfit and it was now time to leave, and as expected, the ghouls followed me outside. What I did not expect however was for them to teleport in front of me before I even had a chance to move, and then attack me like the flesh pinata that I am. This happened a few times with similar results due to the game autosaving when I left the store. The gun is still a prop at the moment, so fighting my way out is not an option, and I cannot manoeuvre past the sheer mass of ghouls. Turns out the solution was quite simple. After dying yet again, right as I load back in I opened the Pip-Boy before the ghouls made it outside, and from there was able to just fast travel away, and thankfully live to fight another day. With the outfit and gun in my possession, I retraced my steps back to Huber's Comics, where thankfully there wasn't a ghoul in sight, and from there just walked down the road and into Good Neighbour to get things started. Heading to the memory den, and for once not regretting being there, I head into one of the side rooms and speak with Kent Connolly, who is about to make this entire run possible. He tasks us with the quest of becoming the Shroud, and yet throughout the entire exchange, never seems to acknowledge that I am in fact dressed exactly like his favourite hero. Anyway, after he strips me for the suit, he immediately gives it back with some extra resistances, along with a legendary effect that reduces all damage from humans by 15%. So honestly, it's not that bad, that's not going to mean much though when I'm fighting the Mechanist robots or the Institute since, but we shall cross that bridge when we come to it. For this quest, I am just to patrol the streets of Good Neighbour until Kent contacts me over the radio and then informs me of some minor crimes in the area, resulting in me attacking the criminals. It's nice to see where the Gotham Knights developers got their quest design from. Oddly enough, the first criminal, Wayne, tells me exactly how to kill him. Well, just a few bullets won't cure. Once he is comparable to a block of Swiss cheese, I leave my calling card in one of the new holes that I created and get to work dispensing justice on whoever is next. That would be AJ, this flat cap wearing Peaky Blinders wannabe, who is selling drugs to kids. Which may not be true given the fact there are no children in Good Neighbour, but we don't ask those kinds of questions here. Rather, we just hold down the trigger until his body stops moving. Next was locating the assassin Kendra, and she herself was pretty straightforward. It was her backup that proved to be the real problem, simply because there were some fairly strong raiders. This is more annoying than deadly as it requires me to use more healing supplies and bullets than I would have normally liked to this early in the run. By the time I'm finished with Kendra and her men, I'm down to just 109 bullets. 
If the gun wasn't automatic then I would be fine, but unfortunately that is not the case, and this thing positively guzzles down ammo like there's no tomorrow. I had the foresight that this may have been an issue, so I made sure to loot just about everything from the people I have killed up to this point, and was able to head over to Diamond City and trade them with Arturo and Myrna for some more bullets. Problem is, 45 rounds are 6 caps each, so even with the scrounger perk which lowers them to 5 and then eventually 4 caps, I am going to be spending an insane amount of money just to have enough ammo to get through some encounters. Luck would shine on me at this very moment however, as my next target, Northy, was accompanied by a few bodyguards, all of which were carrying some machine guns and therefore more 45 rounds. I tried to take each of them out carefully, by which I mean using the least amount of ammo possible, so that I can gain the maximum amount of bullets for what's coming next. And, because people always comment about it, yes, after I killed them, not only did I take the ammo from them, but I also ripped the weapons from their cold dead hands, so that I can have access to the ammo currently inside the guns. I also then sell these weapons for more money slash ammo, so it's a win-win. Once I return to Good Neighbor, I am informed that Kent has been captured due to my righteous endeavours, and now it falls to me to save him, while never breaking character a single time, much to the dismay of everyone involved. This actually works in my favour as it scares most of the raiders off in the final encounter, making for a rather easy battle. With that, the Silver Shroud quest is completed and after some encouraging words from me and Mayor Hancock, Kent is convinced to continue helping out with the crime in Good Neighbour by agreeing to upgrade my costume. Unfortunately, the next upgrade is only available once I hit level 25, which I do not expect to reach before the end of the run sadly, so ultimately it's a moot point. No matter though, I still have the base Silver Shroud armour which he got for me, which is still good enough for now. So, my thought process now was to start the Minutemen questline as they seemed like the most fitting faction. Problem was, I didn't like my chances of simply having enough ammo to win in a fight with the Deathclaw and Conquered, and truth be told, I do not have the patience to sit around and wait for Preston to do the job for me. Money and supplies were also low, so I couldn't just trade for more ammo, which only leaves me one option, taking it by force. Problem is, until you get close to level 20, very few enemies carry weapons that use the ammo I need, the sole exception being the Triggerman, down in Park Street Station. Normally I wouldn't want to come here this early as I don't want to rush immediately through the story, but the needs must I suppose, and I desperately need the ammo. Besides, like I said, the run doesn't exactly end when the Institute is destroyed, but rather once the Mechanist is defeated. Not all of the Trigger Men carry some machine guns unfortunately, as some of them are actually equipped with 10mm pistols or bats. So I am able to get a lot of ammo, but it could definitely have been more. Thankfully, none of them wear armour, so at the very least I'm not trading ammo with someone, and therefore, each submachine gunner I take out is always guaranteed to be a net positive in terms of ammo. I attempted to convince Darla to return to her parents as it seemed like the right thing to do. Unfortunately for her, she was just not in the mood to listen to reason today, meaning she refused my offer at life, and as such she met with the same fate as the rest of Skinny's men. When Skinny was down for good and I was certain I had scrounged up the last piece of ammo, I was happy to see I was going to be leaving with just over 700 bullets. Certainly a lot more than I could afford through trading, and definitely enough to take down the Deathclaw. Once me and Nick make it outside, I tell him to head on to Diamond City without me, while I head back to Concord and begin bullying the underleveled raiders. Burst fire is the way to go for both ammo consumption and effective raider destruction. Three bullets was more than enough to kill anything that moved inside the museum, so I still had well over 500 rounds when I made it back outside to face the reinforcements and the Deathclaw. The fight with the Deathclaw goes about as well as you might expect. How something of that size was able to sneak up on me, I'll never know. Next try and I tapped into my inner Obi-Wan Kenobi as I claimed the fight was now in my favour due to my superior elevation. Truthfully, this was only one part of my success story because like most heroes, friendship was the true saviour of the day as Carla appeared out of nowhere to lend a helping hand. With our powers combined, we felled the Deathclaw and before long I was building beds for Sturges as I got the Minutemen's questline underway. For once, I took the initiative and liberated a couple of settlements before talking with Preston. Those settlements were the Starlight Drive-In, as I played Mole Rat Exterminator, and Abernathy Farm, where I brutally slaughtered multiple human beings to get a small piece of jewellery for the promise of free tomatoes. After this, it was about time I made nice, so I approached Preston, and like clockwork, it was off to Ten Pines Bluff, and from there to the Corvega Assembly Plant to teach Jared a lesson. Just like in Concord, all the raiders here go down to the three bullet burst fire. It makes sense I suppose as a silver submachine gun is currently doing around 15 damage per shot and I must keep in mind that these raiders are meant to be tackled around levels 2-4. to four. I did die once while in the plant, I'm not sure if it was due to overly smart raiders or my own incompetence as I just completely failed to register the nearby engine that was on fire and preparing to explode. Next try I just made my way up top to deal with Jared, which I was able to do before he even noticed me thanks to having a crit that turned his head into mush. Thrilled by the acts of murder committed on their behalf, the citizens of Tampines Bluff, and by that I mean two people, have agreed to join the Minutemen. 
Preston then attempts to tell me his sad backstory of how he's the last minute man, but I zoom past all of it and begin clearing out sunshine tidings of ghouls just to keep things moving with the questline. The ghouls take a few more shots in the raiders, but not enough to be a concern, so before long another settlement is part of the cause, and upon returning Doom and Sanctuary, Preston is already looking to take back the castle, which I of course agree to, and tell him I'll meet him there. Which is a lie. Initially, the plan was to make a quick pit stop in Diamond City for more ammo. I wasn't exactly running low just yet, but if I had the money and the ammo was there, I saw no reason not to get it. As we all know though, I get distracted by the thought of experience very easily, and as such before I knew it I was being interviewed by Inspector Gadget, and me and Dogmeat were tracking a cereal brand across the west side of Boston. During the journey I may have poked my head into the federal ration stockpile, so that I could clear the place out and take some supplies. We can sit here and pretend that I did this because it was in line with the character build, but if we're being honest, I'd already begun killing the raiders outside, and I didn't exactly want to leave a job half finished. Besides, in doing this I can reunite Red with her sister, so really, I am the good guy in all this. Things were a little stranger than normal at Fort Hagen, and I am not just talking about the fact that there were also super mutants inside the building for some odd reason. No, the real strange thing was that when I entered, I noticed that standing on a specific spot in the doorframe caused most of the objects in the world to disappear. Who knew the Silver Shroud had the innate ability to face objects out of existence? Coming here before the castle was probably one of the biggest mistakes I could have made, it's not that I had a hard time or anything, but it's more to do with the fact that I ended up using almost every last bit of my ammo by the time I dealt with Kellogg. It shouldn't really be too surprising, as the synths were always going to take more punishment than the raiders I'd been fighting up until this point. Kellogg himself wasn't much trouble, although he did manage to use a stim pack while being riddled with bullets, so that was bound to cause me to run through more ammo than I would have liked. Leaving with exactly 149 bullets, I am well aware I will not be killing the Mirelurk Queen in the castle anytime soon, so after acknowledging the Brotherhood are in this game for the only time in this run, other than a glitch that happens later on, I head back to Diamond City and Good Neighbor to trade in my spoils and get just under 2,000 caps for my efforts. I don't spend them just yet and instead head in and quickly sprint through Kellogg's memories to get them out of the way, and once I am free, I head for Eleanor, an unmarked vendor just south of Diamond City, as she has 155.45 rounds for sale. This costs me 775 caps, leaving me with a bit over a thousand that I throw at Arturo, Myrna, Cleo and Daisy for as much ammo as I can afford. This puts me up to 812 bullets, and hopefully enough to help Preston make some crab cakes. Assuming I don't hit their shells like an idiot, the submachine gun works well against the squishier side of the lobsters. lobsters. I then engage in the Great Egg Heist of 2287, before coming face to face with the Queen, who isn't exactly on board with the idea of me stealing her children for snacks that I'll have later. This was probably the easiest encounter I've had with this Mirelurk Queen in a very long time. Just standing up high and unloading into its face with the bullets tends to bring the Queen down rather quickly. Sure, it uses up a lot of ammo, but much like the Deathclaw and Conquered, I'm not letting Preston do all the killing, as I want this recording session to be finished before Christmas. Anyway, after that brief distraction, it's back to more settlement grinding, as I still need a few more before the end of the game, plus I have some time to kill before Ronnie Shaw shows up, and I'm about one level too short for the Automatron DLC to start. Preston always goes through the settlements in a specific order, and next up is Greentop Nursery, who are having a small raider problem. To spice things up for us just a little bit, the raiders have kidnapped someone, so that's nice. It doesn't make the quest any more difficult, as the settler is hidden away safely in another room, away from all the raiders, so I'm allowed to be as wildly inaccurate with my gun as I want. Once the hostage is free, I return to Preston, and after going over my Pip-Boy, notice that that's actually the last settlement that I'll need, meaning I can now progress to the Defend the Castle quest when the time comes. In other words, I go and sleep for three days, so when I return to the castle, Ronnie will be present. This leads to a battle with Sarge, and thanks to Ronnie rushing in first for a change, I can just sort of stand outside of the doorway and full auto fire into him whenever he gets close, which surprisingly drains his health rather fast. Normally the ammo spent here would concern me, but being a sentry bot, Sarge does drop a few fusion cores, so they will probably sell for more than enough to recoup my losses. I then proceed with the usual song and dance with the artillery, and as expected, once I turn in the quest, I reach level 15 and can now begin the Automatron DLC. Coming to the aid of Ada, and I notice a few things. First off, the robots aren't as strong defensively as I initially would have thought, so the Silver Sun machine gun is still able to do some work, which is of course appreciated. However, on the other side of things, they inflict a sizable amount of damage on me as well. This could simply be due to the fact that by now the defences of the Silver Shroud armour are just not up to snuff of what I'm facing. And sadly, other than a few perks like Toughness, Refractor and Lone Wanderer, I have no other way of increasing my defences unless I grind to level 25. It's not worth thinking about for the time, so me and Ada head to the General Atomics Factory, where after multiple deaths at the hand of our robot overlords, we were able to come out on top as I gunned down the Robo Brain through the grating, as a full frontal assault was just not working in our favour. This then leads to grabbing more Robo Brains, well, brains. 
No point going into a lot of detail about this, as it's basically just like doing raiding quests for a bit. After we get the last brain, we are meant to head to the Fort Hagen satellite array, but the sad truth is, I do not have the ammo to even think about attempting that. Even after making my rounds at the merchants, I still wasn't satisfied, so rather than throw away my ammo on some random robots and raiders, I figured that the gunners sometimes have a decent supply of 45 rounds, and considering I'm at the stage in the main quest where we need to find Virgil and then fight through green tech, I shifted focus back to the plot and ran right through the glowing sea all the way to his cave, making sure to conserve ammo the entire time. Long story short, not only did the gunners not have any 45 rounds, but fighting my way up through the building caused me to use literally all of my ammo, so right when I was about to face the courser, I had to leave the building, restock, and then come back a few days later just so I could reliably kill who was left without having to resort to gun bashing. Just like Kellogg, by using a stealth boy and stim packs, the courser drags the fight out longer than I would have liked, resulting in me having to go shopping for bullets once again. Afterwards, I of course went and decoded the chip, where I most definitely spoke with the railroad and went about the matter peacefully, as you can see on screen. You know, when I began recording this, I did not actually think that 30% of the runtime of this challenge would essentially be a shopping montage, but here we are. At this point though, I had had enough and decided it was time for a different method of getting ammo. If it's costing too much to purchase, then I would just make some myself. With the power of editing and movie magic, you haven't noticed that I have in fact been planning to do this for a while, as I have increased my intelligence enough to take the first rank in the science park, allowing me to build an ammunition plant. For 10 bullets I require 1 fertilizer and 2 steel, both of which are easy enough to come by, as even just buying the fertilizer in bulk works out a lot cheaper than buying the ammo directly. The only downside of this way is there's a lot of sitting around and just waiting. And unfortunately, resting in the bed does not work, as it all happens in real time. On the bright side, I did find out that if you pick up an item and use the throw button to toss them into the abyss, that they do in fact get added into the ammunition plant's inventory. So that's neat. By the time the machine is done with its task, I have 700 bullets again, so I'm good to continue on. As I only have two quests left, I decided I would just power through what was left of the main story, and then end the video by finishing off the mechanist. Building the teleporter is about as eventful as ever, and when I meet up with Father, I just gun him down. Because that's what heroes do. This then brings me to defending the castle, and it wasn't as bad as I initially thought. By now I was smart enough to invest as many points into the refractor perk as possible, and it definitely made a difference against the abundance of lasers trying to cut through my body. Want to take a guess at what the real problem was with this massive encounter that just had waves upon waves of never ending enemies? Just like Green Tech, the Silver Shroud had to unceremoniously dip from the fight for half a day as he made his way back to Sanctuary to craft more bullets. This is the last time I'm going to be bringing this up by the way, simply because after every quest from this point, I had to go around the commonwealth buying fertilizer just to keep the gun from running out mid fight. During this stockpile I ended up killing Mary McDonough after he outed himself as a synth. Wasn't sure how else to work this into the video, but I felt it was important enough to mention, seeing how this quest rarely triggers for me in casual playthroughs, even after meeting the requirements. Back to the castle and I use all of my ammo again, and now I really regret not investing in the basher perk, as it would have at least made situations like this less painful. Luck would have it, I ran out right before we reached 100% in the defence, so I didn't have to awkwardly leave and return. This means it's time for the nuclear option, and I will not lie, this is probably the most anticlimactic this quest has ever been. Other than when you have to clear out a few cents in the main area of the institute to progress, you don't actually have to fight anyone, so as a way to conserve ammo for the Armatron DLC, I just ran past 90% of the cents and strapped the bomb to the reactor. I then teleported out, pushed the big red button, destroying the institute, finishing the game, and nearly saying my outro before realising we have two more quests left to wrap up. After putting it off for so long, it was now time to attack the raiders and robots at the satellite array. The Rust Devils are a joke as three shots to the head is always a guaranteed kill, which I suppose is realistic. The robots, once again, pack a punch, but I am better off now than I was before because thanks to completing all of the main quests, I am now level 23, allowing me to increase my weapons damage with another rank in the commando perk, along with another point into toughness. To be fair, that will probably rebalance out anyway as I'll need to bring it along with the MSAT when I confront the mechanist, meaning I will lose my benefits from the Lone Wanderer. Back to the matter at hand, Ahab, who probably would have been the most difficult fight here, ends up being a complete pushover as I manage to squeeze in behind him before he's activated and make sure to get a critical hit off on his fusion course. This does a sizable amount of damage and from there some spray and pray takes him out. Although, not before his self-destruct nearly disintegrates me. Not much else to go over as it's just more basic robots and rust devils. There was this weird glitch where I could hear a vertebrate flying around, which then persisted from here all the way to the end of the run. Probably could have fixed the issue by saving the game and reloading, but I thought it was funny, so I decided to keep it going. After building the body for the final brain we stole, it's off to confront the mechanist in her hideout and finish the challenge. Something I noticed here is that ranged attacks from enemies were doing about as much damage as I expected, 
but any time one of the robots managed to close the gap and smack me, I would die almost immediately. Speaking of, I died a lot in here. More than I care to admit, and just about all of them were from getting battered around by random robots, the dual bots were especially annoying as they always seemed to be right up in my face by the time I spotted them, meaning I was seconds away from having tea with Jesus. I should probably show you the reason why we went through all this DLC, and it's all for a few altered lines of dialogue. Silver Shroud. I cannot believe someone so respected, so honourable, would come here and destroy my robots. Your reign of terror ends here, Shroud. The Shroud, as always, walks the path of justice. It is you who has fallen, Mechanist. Lies, Shroud. Lies. I'll admit, I like that attention to detail, but once you've dealt with all the robots and you can talk again, there is no option to keep up with the persona, and instead it's back to the normal dialogue options. As I said at the beginning of the video, I opt to fight the Mechanist, as after all, in the Silver Shroud show you can listen to, they do fight. This is honestly my first time fighting the Mechanist in Fallout 4, and I don't know what I was expecting. It seems when it comes to human boss type enemies, the only way to make it more difficult is to have them use a stealth boy and access to healing supplies. In other words, it's a carbon copy of the fight with the Courser and Kellogg. In fact, I would say this is easier than both, as the Mechanist doesn't have anywhere near the same defences as the Courser, and while he does have backup like Kellogg, Kellogg's two synths are certainly stronger than a single iBot. Needless to say, the fight is over before it truly begins, ending the run I suppose, and proving yes, you can indeed beat Fallout 4 as the Silver Shroud. The build was fun to mess around with, even if at the end of the day it was just an automatic weapons focused character with armour restrictions. With the benefit of hindsight, I would say if any of you are wanting to try this, don't make my mistake. Start with an intelligence stat of 7 so that you can take the science perk at level 2 and begin crafting your own ammo immediately so you don't have to keep coming back and forward to merchants every 20 minutes. Regardless, that's going to be in this challenge video. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider giving the video a like. And if you're interested in more challenges in the future, feel free to subscribe to everyone of these videos are every week. My name is Nerbit. Stay safe, everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.